name is Leonard Kleinrock. I'm chairman of the computer science department at UCLA. We have here a really exciting and dynamic environment. And one of the activities that contributes that environment and that excitement is the constant flow of visitors who come and spend time with us and interact with our faculty and student body. Each year, we select a few from among the very best researchers in the field and ask them to participate in our distinguished lecture series. The high point of their visit is the presentation of a lecture to our faculty and student body. And at that lecture, they present the state of the art in their field of specialty. They describe the research results, the open problems, and the directions in which the field is likely to go. And as you might expect, these lectures always generate a great deal of enthusiasm and interaction. I'm really pleased you've chosen to join us today. Let's go inside. The lecture's about to begin. Good afternoon. We finally figured it out. The way to make sure the speaker gets a cookie is to come here at 4 o'clock and not any later. <laughs> None of the rest of us get any cookies. So if there are any extra cookies around, you can contribute them to some of the people in the front row. And I see you're all rushing to do that. Today we have a really, really special person to speak for us in our distinguished lecture. It's uh, Butler Lampson. This man's name appears everywhere in all of computer science over the last 25 years. He's probably done more for computer science in a variety of areas I'll describe in just a moment than any other person you've heard in this lecture series before. He's just one of the most brilliant people I know and one of the fastest speakers I know. So you folks with laptops, warm up your fingers now. You're going to have a hard time. Butler's background is as follows. His uh, parents uh, were in the diplomatic service. His father was trained in history. There was no science background in his family background, sisters, father, mother. He did his early education abroad in Turkey and Germany. Came back to the United States at the age of 11, went to boarding school um, near Princeton. And there he began to play with things like uh, chemistry, science, and math. But one of his friends had his hand blown off in a chemistry experiment before Butler met him. And I suspect that's why he never went into chemistry. In fact, <laughs> later on we'll find out he, he, he did some serious work in physics. So the interesting thing is there's no encouragement here from his family background in, in science or math. He just emerged as a star student in those areas. Later in high school, he and a friend discovered an unused 650 um, in Princeton. And they managed to gain access to that machine uh, and began to write in, of course, assembly language. It was an impractical Fortran around, which they did not use. Now, as is often the case with these early machines, this was a very interesting machine. Like, it was a pure decimal machine. And everything came out in decimal. It had two I.O. devices. One was the console where you could input words, numbers, with a dial which had 10 positions for each of the digits. Okay. The readout was in bi-quantary. Okay. Took seven bits to describe, indeed, what the particular uh, value of the digit was, or the 10 digit was. The second output device was a combination card reader and card punch something you probably have never heard of, you probably never want to ever see or hear of. Uh, but it would do both in sequence. Uh, it had no core memory. You could buy a 60-word core memory if you liked. It, you could buy an index register, a floating point, more <laughs> drums. His machine had none of those. Okay? It was a really a rudimentary machine. And it was a pure decimal machine meant for business processing. But of course, that's where he cut his teeth. He played with that machine for one year, of course excelled in high school, and went on to Harvard um, to study physics, not chemistry, you should know. And there he found a PDP-1, and spent a couple of years at Harvard um, doing sp spark chamber picture analysis for someone who needed that work done. Um, and he took only one computer course there from Ken Iverson. Ken Iverson had just written a book on APL. There was no implementation capability around, so he studied APL in the pure. You know, no messing around with implementation or trying it out. Just study the, study the system. 
And in fact, when it was all done, um, he thought he understood APL. He could write one-liners. He could write things with no go-tos, you know, packed one-liners. And then he wondered how he could do any kind of text work uh, with uh, this language, which was not meant for text. And Ken quickly explained to him how he could take a matrix, represent characters by putting individual digits in rows and columns, multiplying, intersecting, and summing. And basically pointed out to, uh, to Butler there was more than just numerical calculation you could do with an APL language. Um, he then went to, um, he graduated uh, with a physics degree, went to Berkeley Graduate School to study theoretical physics, and that lasted one year. Because okay. while he was there, he went to one of the, um, um, he switched to EE computer science, I'm sorry. And he had no idea that UC Berkeley did any computing work. And at one of the fall joint computer conferences, he met a friend, Steve Russell, who said, behind this unmarked closed door in the basement of Corey Hall, you will find somebody doing some serious work in time sharing. So we meandered over to the room, opened it up, and found an empty room with a little bit of equipment and some guy at a console. Um, Peter Deutsch doing some work on time sharing. In fact, he was basically trying to run a loader and he had to run the paper tape in twice. And Butler said, why are you running it twice? And the guy said, it was a two-pass loader. And Butler said, huh? And the guy said, yeah, I apologize. I'll fix it uh, next round. Basically, they were running an SDS 930 at the time. Now, there was a project there being run by uh, Dave Evans. He was the project manager. And Mel Pertle was um, also a project manager there, uh, running some of the work. And they were trying to develop a time-sharing system on a very simple machine called an SDS 930. Now, there were big mainframe machines, uh, like on a 7090 running time-sharing at that point. The trick was to make it on a simple machine, quickly, cheaply, that you could buy. And in fact, they managed to do that um, by taking a 930. They added protection. They added uh, some paging with deck interface cards for teletypes. They added a 930 drum from another company for swapping and a disk, the open operating system, and boom, it was done. By the end of 1965, this machine was up and running. And it competed very seriously with some of the other machines. At that point, um, SDS then took it and created this wonderful series called the 940, which populated the world with some excellent time-sharing systems. Lots of companies got started with these machines. In fact, timeshare took a part of them, put them in a central location, and provided a nationwide time-sharing service. But having put them in one location, you need to get at these machines. And so Timeshare had to develop a network to get people to these machines. As you know, some years later, Timeshare stopped making money on time-sharing and made money on networking, which it developed to get to the time-share and access. So there's an interesting story there as to how technologies get developed. Butler wrote his PhD on a spin-off of this work on scheduling and process synchronization. Meanwhile, BBN had been a DEC shop, and they wanted a time-sharing system with a modern machine from DEC. And DEC said they would not build a successor, indeed, uh, to the PDP-6. So these guys got a, PD, a, got a, DEC 9, a Xerox 940, an SDS 940, and with some buddies, basically built a system which led to the 10X operating system. A PDP had no, no, no paging at that time, and they developed it. SDS came out with the Sigma 7 after saying they wouldn't come out with a time sharing machine. And that was basically the end of, of uh, SDS's uh, real role in, in the world. We got the first Sigma 7 here. And that was the machine that was attached, the first machine attached to the ARPANET. And shortly thereafter, SDS went downhill because they didn't follow up on their big lead in time sharing. After Butler got his PhD, he joined the faculty at Berkeley. They started a computer science department immediately as a spin-off from the WECS department with a uh, small group of people like Dick Carr, for example, Jim Morris, and some others. And indeed, they did an ARPA project at that point. They were building another time-sharing system, second generation time-sharing system. And they tried to persuade uh, SDS to, uh, to do it, and SDS said no, scientific data systems. They decided to form their own company, Berkeley Computing Corporation. It ran for two years went out of business. But they built the machine, and they couldn't sell enough of them fast enough. There was a question of time in here. The core of that company then went and joined Bob Taylor at Palo Alto Research Center uh, Park at Xerox. And they basically built a PDP-10 because they needed software they couldn't buy. 
And they developed the, uh, the entire system. Butler designed the processor as a hardware design project. They ran 10X. They built the Alto machine, as you well know. He was involved, indeed, with Charles Simone, um, in which they developed a word processor called Bravo. Bravo, by the way, became Word. A small project like that developed. Did the operating system for Alto. They did some networking. They decided to try to build a, a network which is a thousand times faster than the ARPA network. And they, they designed it, um, but indeed they, they never did build it because at that time Ethernet was coming out in the same location. And at that time even Ethernet was probably too fast for the needs of the uh, PCs and it basically uh, terminated the other project. Now the kind of work that uh, was going on at Park at that time, as you know, is uh, now legend in terms of the email capability, distributed processing, mail procedure calls, um, programming languages, um, a variety of those. All of those, Butler was key um, in terms of a contribution. Then Xerox did a brilliant thing. They fired Bob Taylor. And this gang of smart guys working on the Bob Taylor warned Xerox, you do that, you're going to lose us. Xerox didn't believe it. They fired Bob Taylor. These guys left. Okay. He went to digital and still working in Bob's lab, which he then formed at digital. Since then, um, Button's been working on reliable systems, multi-processor languages, a grand strategy for corporate, uh, net, corporate systems, networking, configuration management problems, reliable software, and, and some electronic publishing. And he's going to talk today about building reliable systems, as you'll see. His message to you is the following. The computer revolution has only just begun. And in the next 10 to 20 years, we're going to see far more than we saw in the last 10 to 20 years. So on an exponential curve, and we haven't begun to see S part of that curve if it does occur. And Butler's going to talk about that as well. Butler. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Len. I should explain to, that uh, I told Len before <laughs> he gave me this... Uh, spectacular introduction that I figured that the, the uh, magnitude of the talk should be scaled to the magnitude of the introduction. So the introduction is about three times the usual size. I figure I can probably talk for two and a half hours, and, and, and that will uh, be perfectly matched to Len's introduction. Okay. So what I want to do, talk to you about today is um, there are three interwoven themes. One of them is how to build a highly available system using the basic, basic idea of consensus, which is uh, a, a primitive that allows uh, se several computers or several processes to agree on something. Um, and I'll explain how, if you have such a primitive, you can, you can use it, you can piggyback from it, you can use it as a building block to build arbitrary, highly available systems. And this is interesting because um, we depend on computer systems more and more and it's increasingly irritating when they don't actually fu function at the time that we want them to. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what, what for most purposes is the best practical algorithm for achieving con consensus in a highly available way. This is an algorithm designed by Leslie Lamport. And he gave it the name Paxos. And the third thing I'm going to do is show you a methodology and approach for understanding and designing uh, concurrent fault-tolerant systems. So these three themes will be interwoven. So let's start by exploring um, what we mean by highly available computing and how we're going to go about getting it. Uh, think of this as motivation for studying the consensus problem. So the way you get high availability is there's two possibilities. You can build the components so that they're perfect. And sometimes that's quite feasible. And modern disk drives have mean time between failures in the order of a million hours. But in general, high availability means redundancy. You can't build individual components that are perfect. And you want the system to be able to work even when some of the components are broken. There's a variety of subtle ways to get redundancy, but the simple-minded way to get it is replication. You make several copies of each part, uh, and you design the system so that all the copies, all the copies of a part that aren't broken, do the same thing, and, and then you can get the desired result from any of the function parts. So replication is good for availability. Um, second observation: any kind of computing you want to do, you can express as a state machine. So if we know how to build a replicated state machine then we can do arbitrary highly available computing. This observation was made by Leslie Lamport in the classic paper 
about 15 years ago. But it hasn't been taken up very systematically. So let's study a little bit more carefully how this works. Um, the basic idea is extremely simple. If you have a state machine that's deterministic, and you have two copies of it, and you feed both copies the same inputs, then the two copies will proceed in exactly the same way, They'll produce exactly the same outputs, and go through the same sequence of states. Often we call the individual copies processes. And now we can see the basic idea for building a highly available system is very simple. We make a bunch of copies of a state machine, and we get them to agree on what the inputs should be. And all, then all the copies that are working will evolve in exactly the same way. So a couple of concrete examples of this. You might want to build a replicated storage system, for example, a replicated file system, where the basic operations are read from some address and write some data value into some address. You apply those operations repeatedly, and you expect the system to be highly available as long as there's some number of copies that, that are continuing to work. And you expect all the copies that, that are still working to return the same values from, from read operations. Uh, quite a different kind of example, in fact, one of the ones that motivated Lamport's work originally, is if you want to build an airplane flight control system. Now, very abstractly, this has a, a <coughs> Uh, actions to read instruments and to, and, to con and to do things like raising the flaps or controlling other parts of the airplane. And again, you'd like to have high availability for obvious reasons if the functioning of the airplane depends on the functioning of this flight control system. And it better keep working or the airplane will fall out of the sky. Okay, so we've learned that if we can, we can build several copies of a state machine, and if we can get them all to agree on the inputs, then we'll be able to do reliable computing. So agreeing on some value is a problem called consensus, technically. And what a replicated state machine needs to do is agree on a whole sequence of values. So for example, the first input might be write into location x the value 3. The second input might be read from location x, and you expect to get back the answer 3. And then there'll be lots more inputs where you read and write more values. And we want all the copies to agree that the first input should be this write and the second input should be a read. Clearly, if there are multiple clients for this thing and they're disagreeing on what the sequence of reads and writes is, then you can't expect them to behave in the same way. So our end goal will be a good algorithm for doing a whole sequence of consensus problems. And we'll start by studying how to do just one. Okay, so to get, make this a little bit more concrete, let's think about a couple of simple implementations of consensus. Um, the simplest possible one is you, you have just one, you pick one of the processes to be special. And you make it uh, choose the first uh, input value and tell everybody about it. And then it chooses the second input value, gets consensus on the second input, and tells everybody about it. Then it gets consensus on the third input by just doing its thing, tells everybody about it. That's great. What's wrong with it? Well, it's not fault tolerant. If this one designated guy fails, then you're out of luck. So that's not very satisfactory. Uh, in the mid-70s, people uh, started to realize that if you want to build fault tolerant systems, you should have several processes involved, and you should somehow do what a major do whatever you want to do do with a majority of the processes, and that's the way you can resolve um, disagreements. So you might say, let's get consensus by having a set of processes, and we'll let each one of them choose a value. And if a majority of them manage to choose the same value, then that'll be the answer. And that's fine, except again, it's not fault tolerant. Um, if a majority fail to agree on a value, then you're stuck. Or even if a majority does agree, if part of it fails, you still may be stuck. For example, suppose you have three processes. Two of them agree on the value 1, and the third one agrees on the value 6. And then one of the two guys that agreed on 1 fails. Now you're looking at, you're actually still looking at a majority of the processes, but one of them has chosen 1, and one of them has chosen 6. And you don't know what the third guy chose, because he's down. So you're still, again, in the soup. So these two simple examples should illustrate to you the fact that the problem is not quite as straightforward as you might have thought at first. OK, before we plunge into the details of consensus, I'd like to say just a little bit more about how you use it to build efficient highly available computing. The issue here is, as we'll see when we study consensus in more detail, detail but as perhaps you've gotten a sense from these uh, simple examples of things that don't work, um, consensus is not cheap to achieve. So if you want to run a state machine that has lots of actions, it would be better if you didn't have to achieve consensus on each individual action. You'd like to find some way by which you can run consensus relatively infrequently and then do something else uh, that's cheaper most of the time. Uh, well, we know a cheap way to do uh, concurrent computing. You lock parts of the state and let one process work on it. 
The problem with that is it's not fault tolerant. If a, if a process locks the state and then fails, the state's locked, you don't know what, what, what the situation is, and you can't recover. So the way you get around this problem is by using a technique called leases, which are sort of, you can think of them as fault tolerant locks. And what makes them fault tolerant is that they time out. Like ordinary locks, leases can be hierarchical. And you only need to run consensus for the root lease. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Suppose I have a synchronous system. Synchronous means that the processes have clocks with bounded skew. So roughly speaking, they're all within epsilon of root, they stay all within epsilon of real time, or at least all within epsilon of each other. So the basic strategy then for doing um, reliable computing in this world is run consensus to issue a lease on some component of the state. So you, the lease is going to run for a particular time, say until 6 o'clock, and it's going to expire. You grant the lease to some particular process. And that process now is the master of X until 6 o'clock. And the notion is now that during the period of the lease, until 6 o'clock, the master can read and write X freely. Um, an important property to make this work is that writes have to take some bounded amount of time that you know beforehand. Why? Because if you do a write that goes on until after 6 o'clock when the lease is expired, then you can't predict what the situation is going to be. If the master fails, uh, the value of x is inaccessible until 6 o'clock when the lease expires. So you don't want the lease to be too long. Um, once, when the lease is near to running out, you run consensus again to renew it until 7 o'clock. And in this way, you can have a situation in which you can dole out responsibility for parts of the state to different machines uh, in, a, in, a, in a highly fault-tolerant way. There is, of course, a trade-off. If you make the lease short, then if the process fails, it will only be a short time before the lease expires, so you'll be able to recover quickly but it's going to cost more to keep renewing the lease over and over again. Make the lease 30 seconds. You don't have to renew it every 30, every 30 seconds or maybe every 25 seconds. But on the other hand, if a failure occurs, it'll only be 30 seconds to wait. If you make a long lease, recovery will be slow. It'll be less cost to renew it. Class, classic examples of situations where you use this kind of style. Uh, X is a multi-ported disk, for instance, a multi-ported SCSI disk. And uh, you're running, you have two processors, one of which is running uh, a file system on that disk, and the other one is a standby processor. The, the master file, the master processor takes out a lease on the disk. Um, it, you renew it periodically. If the master guy fails, you wait until the lease is timed out, and then it's safe for the, for the other guy to take over and start reading and writing the disk. Another example is X is a cache block. Although typically when people design uh, main memory caches, they don't worry too much about fault tolerance. But if you're designing a caching file system where the cache, where the, the unit is, is a, a block of a file, then you often do worry about fault tolerance and people use the same technique. Um, like any good idea in computing, this idea can be made recursive or hierarchical. Um, it may be that running consensus to issue a lease is still too expensive. How can you get around that? Well, um, do it in two stages. Run consensus once to elect a grandmaster. And he, so he gets a lease on being the grandmaster. And then M, the, the master, can give out subleases on parts of the state X and Y to workers. And he can do that unilaterally because he's the master. Each worker then gets to be a submaster for X and Y, just as in the previous example. The workers, when they need to renew their leases, they go back to the master. That's cheap because they only have to talk to one guy. They don't have to run a full consensus protocol. The master renews its lease by consensus. And consensus is expensive, but there's only one master with only one lease. So that's going to be much cheaper than renewing all the individual leases by doing consensus. And the other angle on this is that the master is a lot simpler than the workers, perhaps, and therefore much less likely to fail if you design it properly. So you can probably afford to give a longer lease to the master. Of course, th that won't be true if your criterion for a good system is that the maximum time to recover should be short. But often the criterion for a good system is simply that there shouldn't be more than 10 minutes of downtime a month, in which case if failure is rare, it may be OK to lengthen the lease period. So this is a standard strategy, which is often used in replicated file systems and in, in clusters for high availability. Um, for taking the basic lease idea and, and, and making it both highly efficient by virtue of the subleasing scheme and highly fault tolerant by virtue of the top level consensus. Okay, so that's a sketch of the application. Uh, if we know how to do consensus, we'll know how to build highly available systems because we'll simply build these state machines with some combination of leases and consensus for, for running their inputs. Um, and then we'll be, we'll be able to do uh, any sort of high available, highly available computing that we want by just coding it up into the state machine. 
So how are we going to do consensus? Well, um, it's a little bit subtle, but the intuitive idea is the one I said before, that several processes or computers or whatever you want to call them achieve consensus, but they all agree on some, some value. And remember, the basic application we have in mind is the values they're going to agree on is the inputs to the state machine. Um, consensus turns out to be fairly tricky, and we're going to have to stud study carefully exactly what we mean by consensus in order to make sure that we know what we're doing. But consensus is tricky when there are faults. Um, in particular, the startling result proved in the early 80s by Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson that if you have an asynchronous system with a single faulty process, you can't achieve consensus. You can't, there's no algorithm that's guaranteed to terminate that achieves consensus, i.e., i.e., that causes all of the processes that are not faulty to agree on a value. This is very counterintuitive, but it's true. In a synchronous system, you can get consensus, and you can even get consensus in situations where some of the processes are making arbitrary faults, i.e. lying to other processes, behaving in what you might anthropomorphically think of as a, as a malicious way. Um, but that's, quite, that's called Byzantine agreement. It's quite expensive to achieve that kind of consensus, but it is possible. So you can use this consensus and state machine approach to, to do arb, arb, essentially arbitrary fault-tolerant computations if you're willing to pay, pay for the cost of the, of the consensus. I might just mention a couple of more specialized applications of consensus. Um, one that's very common is if you're running a distributed transaction system and you want to commit the transactions, that is a consensus problem. Everyone needs to agree on whether a particular transaction commits or aborts. Uh, another example, other examples of consensus are group membership. You'd like to agree on who the current members of some group are, or if you want to elect a leader, you'd like to agree on what leader's been elected. So those are more specialized examples. Okay, we're going to study consensus, and we're going to remember, remember the other part of my agenda is to show you, is to use this uh, consensus problem uh, to illustrate uh, a particular style for, for analyzing and understanding a subtle uh, algorithms. Yes? Uh, the Fisher, the nature of the of this other dimension uh, is giving a particular model, this model of the of Bluetooth, giving a Another one, what is a computer? What of a primitive is available to you? You probably can do it. Yes. I wonder if you're going to define precisely what do you mean by a system? No. No. <laughs> that, 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 would be, that would be a very interesting talk, but it's not the talk that I have in mind for this afternoon. So we're going to hand wave over that. Um, so let's spend a little bit of time thinking about what the strategy is going to be for specifying uh, a system. And then we're going to use these ideas to specify what we mean by consensus. And we're going to use an extension of these ideas to explain how to understand implementations of consensus. But these ideas are, in fact, much more broadly applicable. You can use the techniques that I'm about to describe to specify any system that has state. Um, and I recommend them highly for that purpose. So the, the, we begin by saying that the only thing we care about specifying is a sequence of external actions of the system. Our notion is that you can't look inside the black box and see what's going on inside the system. All you can specify is what happens at the interface. So the specification is going to consist of somehow specifying, specifying some properties of the sequences of actions that, this, that the system can, can uh, generate. And it turns out to be convenient to divide these sequences into, two, into these properties into two classes. There are safety properties, which roughly speaking are properties that say nothing bad ever happens. If the system ever does it anything, it does it according to these rules. And it turns out that the most convenient way to define a safety property is by a state machine. Uh, you all know what a state machine is. There's, it has a state, which is a set of values. And we usually divide up the state into little pieces called variables. And then there are actions, which are name changes to the state. And there's two kinds of actions, internal ones and external ones. And it's the external ones that we're really going to care about from the point of view of the specification. We'll see exactly where, where that becomes critical when we study the question of what it means for one system to implement another one. In addition to safety properties, which say that nothing bad ever happens, by the way, the sequential analog of a safety property is so-called partial correctness. Uh, if, the, if the sequential program terminates, then it gives the, the right answer. Um, the other kind of properties are so-called liveness properties, which roughly speaking say that, some, that eventually something good does happen. The system doesn't just sit there. Right? The safety, safety property says that 
the sequence has to have the property that, that uh, if it ever generates, uh, if x ever appears in the sequence, then x over 2 has to have appeared previously. That's a safety property. But you could satisfy that property by never, never generating any x's. That would not satisfy the Leibniz property that says that eventually 103 has to appear. Um, and it turns out that if you have both a safety property and a Leibniz property, then you can define, define any, uh, between those two, you can define any property of the sequence of actions. So examples of systems that can be described in this style are, uh, in, in the sequential domain, data abstractions. You have the classic example of a stack or a symbol table or any uh, sequential data abstraction. You can specify that by des describing its external behavior in this style. Uh, you can also do concurrent and distributed systems in this style using basically the same techniques. Although it took about 10 years between the time that Tony Hoare uh, explained how to do this for sequential systems until people started to understand that you could also use it for concurrent systems. OK, so that's our style for specification. And I'm going to focus uh, in this talk on safety properties. They're the ones that we're mostly concerned about. The Leibniz properties are quite a bit more difficult to deal with. And from a practical point of view, one isn't usually nearly as concerned about proving a Leibniz property. For many reasons, which probably the most important is the Leibniz, all the Leibniz property tells you is that eventually the system is going to do something good. What you usually want to know is that it's going to do something good by 6 p.m. For example, this talk should be over by 6 p.m. Um, and that's a safety property, not a liveness property. Um, OK, so what do we mean by implements? Uh, a system Y implements another system X if every external behavior of Y is also an external behavior of X. In other words, and this, this definition is motivated by the idea that if you're looking at a Y implements X, if it has a property that when you're looking at a Y, you can't tell that you're not looking at an X. So anything that y does, it should be able to, to explain as something that x could have done. And then it also has to be true that y's Leibniz property implies x's, but we're not going to worry about Leibniz properties anymore. I just put that in for completeness. OK, so now we understand what a spec is, and we have an idea of what implementation means. It means the external behaviors are the same. So let's think about how to write a spec. Uh, and then I'm going to illustrate this by showing you specs for consensus. And then you can take these wonderful ideas off, and you can try them out on the, the systems that you need to do and see how well they work. So how to write a spec? Um, first step is figure out what the state is. And this, surprisingly, turns out to be the hardest part. Because usually when you sit down to figure out what the state is in a spec, you have some implementation in mind. And you scratch your head and try to find a mathematical looking uh, description of the imp implementation state you have in mind. It's usually the wrong thing to do. Um, because you want the spec to be distinct from the implementation. And the challenge is to find a state description it makes the spec as clear and as simple as possible. And we will see an example of that in just a couple of slides. Then the next thing you do is describe the actions. You have to say what they do, to, what each action does to the state, and what, what value it returns. Um, good things to bear in mind when you're trying to write a spec. Um, very important is that notation is critical. And the reason it's critical is that it helps you to think about what's going on. So I'm sitting down to write a specification for a system, a system that has some complexity. Try to develop a suitable vocabulary within which to do that. You may have to change the vocabulary a few times in order to get something that's good and clear. Uh, as, as in almost everything in life, less is more, fewer actions in the spec are better. And we'll see uh, a concrete example of that in just a minute. And more non-determinism is better because it allows more implementations and you want the spec to be as unrestricted as possible. OK, so with that background, let's look at the spec for consensus. It's very, very simple. The state consists of a single variable called the outcome. And the outcome is either a value, which is one, one of the values that you're going to agree on, or it's nil. And it starts out nil. And there's two actions, and they're both external. The first action is allow v, which means v is going to be one of the values that you could achieve consensus on. Um, it's critical that there be something like this, because otherwise you could solve it. Suppose, the, suppose, suppose it was OK to achieve consensus on any value. Then we might as well just say, well, we'll always achieve consensus on 0 and the problem solved. It's clear that a system like that is not going to be very useful. So we need some way to specify what values were, are, are candidates for consensus, and that's what allowed us. So what does the spec say? It's a little bit surprising. It says when the, the allow action can do one of two things. Remember, we're describing a state machine here. This is a program, a way to describe a state machine in a simple programming language. And it says the allow action 
can cause one of two transitions. One is, if outcome is nil, then you can set outcome to v. In other words, choose that v as the, as the outcome. Alternatively, you can do nothing. Throw the v on the floor. Okay? And the other action is outcome, and it gives back the answer. So it either returns the outcome, or possibly it returns nil. So what that says is, even if the choice has already been made, even if the outcome's already decided, the outcome action might still return nil. Now you might say, gee, why such a sloppy spec? Why not insist on giving the answer back? The reason is that in the intended implementations, um, the outcome is going to be stored in a lot of different nodes. And the node you're talking to might not have heard about it yet. So even though the outcome is decided, the node you're talking to might say, I don't know yet. So if we wrote the spec without this alternative, it would be too strong. We wouldn't be able to implement it at a reasonable cost. However, we would like consensus to terminate eventually. So now I've put in red additions to the previous spec. In order to put that into this spec, we're going to add another variable, done, which is a Boolean. And we're going to modify this outcome guy so that if you're not done, then, you can, then it's OK to return nil. Otherwise, you have to return the outcome. Once you're done, you have to return the outcome. Okay? And then we're going to add another action, which is an internal action. That means it happens inside the specification, but it's not externally visible, which says if outcome is, is non-nil, then you can set done to true. So now our notion of how this spec is going to work is it's going to be a bunch of occurrences of the allow action and a bunch of occurrences of the outcome action. And once the terminate action is going to happen and set done to true, and after that, we're guaranteed that doing the outcome action is always going to give us the outcome. Okay, so this is what you might call terminating consensus. It doesn't actually say anything about termination, but it does say that once the terminate has happened, then we're going to definitely get the answer back every time. Okay, well, it turns out there's a little bit of a technical problem with the spec I've given so far, and it arises from the fact that the choice is made by the allow action, by the allow action itself. And in the implementations we have in mind, that's not really what's going to happen. What's going to happen in the implementations is that there are going to be some allow actions which are going to decide what the choices are. For example, if you're trying to elect a leader, uh, each potential leader will do an allow action. But then the, the choice of which of those is chosen as the outcome is going to be made later. And it turned, there's technical difficulties with having the choice made too early in the spec. So here is a spec which has, which is equivalent to the previous one in its external behavior, but which takes account of this fact about the implementation. So we're going to introduce a new state variable. It's going to be more complicated than spec, but it's going to be closer to the implementation. This new state variable is called allowed, and it's simply a set of values. And what the allow action is going to do is just add v to the set of allowed values. So allow is no longer going to make the decision. It's just going to remember that v is an allowed value. And then down here, there's going to be another internal action called agree, which is going to say, you can agree that v is the answer if v is in allowed, as a member of the allowed set, and the outcome is still nil. And that, in that case, we'll set the outcome to v. That can only happen once. <clears throat> and now we have something that's pretty close in spirit, anyway, to the implementations we have in mind, which are a bunch of people come along and say, OK, these are the guys that are allowed. And then something happens which causes the choice to be made. So this is the spec we're going to work with. I'm doing it time pretty well. OK, now that we've done the spec, we're ready to talk about the implementation. And before I talk about implementations of consensus, I'm going to go back to methodology and discuss the question of how, in general, are we going to prove? We know what, what it means for, for an implementation to implement the spec. It has the same external behavior. Or, Speaking more carefully, every external behavior of the implementation is also a possible external behavior of the spec. But how are we going to prove that? Um, if we wanted to prove that directly, well, these external beha behaviors are sequences of actions, in general, infinite sequences. Uh, we've got to prove that one infinite sequence of actions, one set of sequences of actions, is a subset of another set of sequences of actions. That's an ugly thing to do. Those are messy objects to deal with. Those proofs are painful. So we'd like to have a simpler way to do the proof. And here's a simple, a simple way that works incredibly well. You want to prove that y implements x. So here's y, and here's x up here in the picture. What you do is you define an a thing called an abstraction function from the state of y to the state of x. And then you show that y simulates x. What do we mean by that? Well, first of all, f, a boring part, and then an interesting part. The boring part, f has to map initial states of y to initial states of x. And then, 
for every possible y action and every possible starting state for it, it has to be the case that there's some sequence of x actions that looks the same externally, such that this diagram can use, such that if you map y up to f of y and then do the x actions, you get the same result as if you do the y action and then map y prime up to f of y prime. Okay? So if this is true, then it must be true that any sequence of y actions is simula simulates a sequence of x actions because you can just stack up, stack up lots of copies of this diagram. And what we mean by the same externally is that if this is an external action, then this had better be a sequence of x actions that contains the same external action. And it could have additional internal actions. We don't care about those. If this is an internal action, then this had better consist of only internal actions, or it could be empty. The amazing thing about this method is that subject to a couple of caveats that I'm not going to go into, uh, if it's true that y implements x, then you can always prove it by using this method. And you can see the great thing about this method is that once you've found the magic abstraction function by a, a stroke of genius, um, all you have to do is, is mechanically check that every possible y action, you, know, you look in the implementation, there's 73 different actions. You check for each one that there's a corresponding sequence of x actions for which this diagram commutes. And then you're done. So you can think about each action in isolation. <clears throat> um, it turns out to make this always work, you may have to mess around a little bit with y first. And I'm not going to ex explain the ways in which you might have to mess around with y. One other thing that should be said about the method is that uh, typically in order to make this work, you also need to introduce what are called invariants, the purpose of which is to characterize the reachable states of the y machine. Because remember, you have to prove that this works for every po possible starting state. So if you can cut down the number of starting states, it'll be easier to do that proof. And typically, the way you do that is by writing invariants that restrict uh, what the possible st starting states are. And of course, you have to prove that those invariants hold. And you can do the, that by showing that they're maintained by each action. So again, that has a nice property that you work on one action at a time. You never have to do any inductions or anything complicated. So the only hard part is finding the abstraction function. Okay, well, let's get a little bit of practice in finding abstraction functions by looking at the abstraction functions written down in green here uh, for the two simple implementations we looked at before of consensus. We've seen the spec for consensus. So first implementation, there's this one coordinator process. has the same state as the spec. It tells everyone else the outcomes. What's the abstraction function? Well, the outcome of the spec is just the outcome of the coordinator. Pretty obvious. And done is true in the spec if Everyone's been told. Okay? I'm not going to write that down as a formula, but it should be obvious how to do that. Um, in the majority case, uh, done is going to be the same. And done is going to be, always be the same in all the examples we look at. So I'm not going to mention done, the abstraction function for done again. The abstraction function for outcome, outcome is the choice of a majority. And if a majority hasn't been established yet, then outcome is still nil. So that's simple enough. Oh, okay. but we know that those implementations are no good. They're not fault tolerant. We need an implementation that is fault tolerant. How are we going to get one? Well, before showing you how to do it, I want to uh, deliver another little homily. We already had a homily on how to design specs. Now we're going to have one on how to do implementations. So the first rule, if you want to do an implementation, is write the spec. If you don't know what it is you're trying to implement, the chance of implementing it successfully is poor. Um, then you have to be creative and dream up some idea for the implementation. <clears throat> and it turns out that usually the idea is embodied in the abstraction function from the state of the implementation to the state of the spec. And again, we're going to see a concrete example of that when we look at the Paxos implementation for consensus. Um, if you can't figure out what the abstraction function is, then you haven't yet, done, done it. You haven't yet grasped the idea of the implementation. Having done this now, you apply the methodology. Check that every implementation action simulates a spec action. That's easy to do. Uh, in general, to succeed in this check, you will have to add some invariants to make it easier. And of course, you have to check that each invariant really is an invariant. Um, when you do this, of course, what will happen is you'll discover that your implementation is no good. That you can't actually, that this isn't actually true. So what are the possibilities then? You can change the abstraction function. You can change the implementation, fix the bugs. Or you can decide that you didn't write the correct spec. For example, if I had written the consensus spec to say that um, the outcome action always returns the outcome, 
then I would discover when I look at any distributed implementation that it's not true. That the, that the outcome action always returns the outcome. And at that point, I would probably decide that I wrote the wrong spec. I have to weaken the spec. I thought I could do that wonderful spec, strong spec, but it's too expensive. I can't afford it. Okay, the other piece of good advice that I'm sure you've heard many times before is make the implementation correct first and then make it efficient. Um, typically, when you want it to be more efficient, you're going to have more complicated invariants that relate different parts of the state to each other in comp more complicated ways. And of course, you might need to change the spec to get the implementation to be more efficient. It's a wonderful uh, remark that Ed Dykstra made many years ago. He said, an efficient program is an exercise in logical brinksmanship. If the program's really, really simple and, and slow, it'll be easy to see why it works. As you make it more and more efficient, you come closer and closer to the cliff. If you go over the cliff, then the program stops working. So you're trying to walk the brink. And that's definitely true. And we'll see some examples of this, too. I will show you first a straightforward but somewhat costly implementation of the basic idea. And then we'll talk about uh, some, some optimizations for making it more efficient, but also make it a bit more difficult to understand. OK, so now we're ready to uh, study the Paxos algorithm itself. And we're going to do this in two parts. First, I'm going to explain the idea, and then I'm going to actually show you the algorithm. Once you have the idea, the algorithm is easy to understand. If you don't get the idea, you will just stare at the algorithm and you'll say, how could that possibly work? Okay. And furthermore, I want to peddle this notion that there is a key idea that, yeah, behind any implementation. Okay. So our idea is there's going to be a set of agent processes indexed by an index set i. So we'll, we'll write uh, process I1, I2, and so forth, to name the processes. And the job of the agents is to do what they're told in the algorithm. The agents have some persistent or stable state that survives crashes, because you've got to remember the answer, otherwise it's no good. Uh, there's also going to be some leader processes that tell the agents what to do. And in general, the leader processes are volatile. They come and go, and their state is lost when they fail. So they're not really very important. Um, well, basically, what we want to do is get a majority of the agents. But we already saw that if you just say we're going to get a majority of the agents in the most simple-minded way, it's not fault -tone. So the key idea is we're going to have a set of rounds, or sequence of rounds, actually, index, indexed by numbers n. And in each round, we're only going to be working on one possible value. This is the key idea. And in each round, some of the agents may accept the value of that round. And if it's ever the case that you get a round in which a majority accepts the value, then that's the outcome. Okay? An obvious problem is that it better be the case that if you get two majorities where everyone accepts the outcome, or, sorry, if you get two rounds in which there's a majority that accepts the outcome, they better accept the same value. Otherwise, it won't be consensus. So that's the challenge in making this idea work, is to make sure that if you, if you, get, a, if you get a majority twice, it's for the same value. So this is the basic notion that we're going to take this majority idea and we're going to spread it out across rounds which means that we can stay out of the trap of being non-fault tolerant, but the price we pay for it is that we have to solve the problem of making sure that if we get two majorities in different rounds, they're for the same value. <clears throat> okay, so how are we going to achieve this? Um, well, the agents are going to have some state, and we're going to call the state S, and we're going to subscript it by the agent number and the round number, I and N. And the state of each agent is either going to be some value or it's going to be one of the two special symbols, no or neutral. And everybody starts out neutral. So you might have thought, well, everybody starts out neutral, and then they get to some value. But we have this extra wrinkle that they may also get to no. And that turns out to be essential for making the thing work. So you might say this is a second insight that we need to have in order to get it to work. And it's a rule that the state component can only change from neutral to something else. Once it's become no or become a value, it doesn't change anymore. OK, so the value, what's, now we're going to define the value of round n. And the idea is, look around at all the agents. And if any of the agents um, has a v as its value, then that's the value of round n. And if no agent, if every agent is either neutral or no, then the value for round n is nil. OK? So for this to make sense, um, we want an invariant that says a round has at most one value. That's critical. The whole thing is going to collapse if two there won't be a single well-defined value for a round if two different agents have different values for that round. 
So we're going to have to maintain this invariant in the algorithm. Now we're ready for the abstraction function, which is just making a little bit more precise what I said in two of you before. The outcome is, if you can find a round such that the guys that have that round's value are a majority, then that's the outcome. Otherwise, the outcome is nil. Okay, for this to be well defined, it had better be the case, what I said before, that if two rounds both have majorities, they better be majorities for the same value. <coughs> Otherwise, there won't be a well defined outcome. Okay, so with this abstraction function, which is sort of the obvious abstraction function that you're going to go for, you're forced into this invariant in order that it should be well defined. And now the challenge of the algorithm is to maintain these two invariants. And this is the one that's tricky. So to understand how to maintain this invariant, you need to introduce one more idea, which is the idea of a stable predicate. A stable predicate is a, is a predicate on the state which has a property that once it becomes established, it stays established. Stays, once it becomes true, it stays true. So in the fancy language of temporal logic, P implies henceforth. I won't use that notation again, so don't worry about it. That's just to show that I know what it is. Um, why is this important? Well, the reason is that it's safe to act on if you, find it, if, you put, if you find out that some predic stable predicate has become true, then it's safe to act on that knowledge, because nothing that can happen later can make it false. If you find out that some predicate that's not stable is true, in a distributed system it's dangerous to act on it, because crashes and concurrency and all kinds of other things can happen in the system that could make it false now. So stable predicates are really good. <coughs> Let's look at some predicates that are stable in this world. Um, a round, the value of a round is V is stable. The value of a round, once it's established, can't change. The fact that the value of agent I's state in round n is V or is null is stable. Because it can only change from neutral to either V or null. It can't change once it's acquired in those values. So, so the, these facts mean that we can define the idea of a round, round n being dead, which means that a majority of the agents have their state set to null in that round. And that's stable. Furthermore, a round can be successful if it has a majority for some value. And that must be stable. Because once the majority of the guys have set their states to V, the states can't change. So that can't, that's stable. Here's a slightly more subtle stable predicate, which is going to be important for the algorithm. This says N is anchored if for every M that is less than N, either the previous round M is dead, or uh, N has the same value that M has. So N is anchored if every previous round, looking back to the beginning, is either dead or has the same value that n has. Then n is anchored. And I think you can sort of see why that's going to be useful in making sure that things stay put once they get put. But we're going to, understand, we're going to see the details of that in just a minute. Okay, so now let's take our invariant 2, which I've rephrased slightly <coughs> using the notation from the previous um, slide. The invariant we need to establish is that any two successful rounds have the same value. This follows from a slightly more complicated invariant, which says that if you have a round n and another round m that's less than n, then if m is successful, then the later round has to have its value either nil or equal to m's round. Okay, so this, this invariant says any two successful rounds have the same value. This one says that if a round is successful, then any later round um, has to have the same value. And this in turn follows from, well, first, first we take this M is successful and we weaken it to say M is not dead. Okay? So this follows from this because this is weaker than that. And this is e equivalent to saying that for every round, either the round is nil or for every M that's less than M, M is dead or Vn equals Vn. So all we did here was shuffle the quantifier around. But now this is good because this thing here is the definition of anchor. So now we see that this is the same as saying for every round n, either the value is nil or the value is anchored. Okay, so we started from this invariant, we weakened it a couple times, and then we used our definition of anchored. And the conclusion is that what we have to show is that when we choose the value of a round, it stays anchored. So now we can see what the job of the algorithm is, simply to make sure that when a particular round chooses its value, it chooses it in such a way that the round stays anchored, and since that the round is anchored, and since anchored is a stable property, we know that once we've made that choice, we don't have to worry about it's going away. So now we're beginning to get to something that's practical to implement. Okay. 
slight digression. Um, we had the other invariant, remember, which said that each round should only have one value. How are we going to achieve that? The answer is we're going to achieve that by the way the leader processes work. So invariant one is going to be maintained by having at most one leader process. And that leader process is going to be responsible for the value of that round. It's going to hang on to. And we're going to make sure that um, a given round only has a single leader process. And furthermore, that if the leader process fails and starts up again, it doesn't go back and try to do a previous round. It starts up with a new round. So how are we going to achieve that? We're going to number the rounds by pairs, consisting of some uh, um, integer or other sort of sequential identifier, and the leader identifier. Okay, And so each leader is going to choose for his round number a pair in which the leader part is his identifier. And he's going to choose a J that he never used before. So for example, if he has a clock that constantly increments, he can choose that. So the state of the leader is going to be the values that the leader chooses for each round, which start out nil. And then each, the leaders are also going to keep the allowed sets. So the way we're going to implement allow is by going to, the leader and, going to some leader and saying, OK, um, this value is allowed, and that leader is going to remember it. And the abstraction function for allow, remember, I already showed you the abstraction function for done and the abstraction function for output. We still need the abstraction function for allow. The, the set of values that's allowed is going to just be the union of the sets that all the leaders keep. No big deal. Okay. Now, with all that, we are ready for the algorithm. Here it is. Remember, we had to maintain two invariants. The first one was only one value per round. And we maintain that by making sure that each leader has a, runs different rounds from all the other leaders, different numbered rounds from all the other leaders, and that the leader doesn't try to run the same round twice. So we've got that. The other invariant we have to maintain is that every round is anchored. So how are we going to do that? Well, here's the strategy. The leader chooses a new, a, new, a new N consistent with the rules that I just gave. And then the leader queries a majority of the agents and tries to find out what their state is. So the leader says, tell me what your state is up to round n. When the agents get one of these queries, they don't just give back their state. Instead, they look back at all the rounds before round n, and any place where the state is still neutral, the agent sets its state to no. Okay? Why does, should it do that? Because the leader needs to know enough about the agent's states that it can stay anchored. And that means it's got to be able to look back and see that previous rounds are either dead or find values for them. Well, the agent certainly can't pony up values at ma like magic when it's queried. But it can set its previous states to null. So doing this will guarantee that the leaders will be able to make some progress. And it can't hurt to set neutral states to null. Definitely won't cause us to reach consensus on something that we shouldn't have reached consensus on. So this is a safe thing to do, and it also means that we can make some headway. So the agent does that, sets all his state for previous rounds to null, and then the agent gives back his, his answer. And the leader collects this stuff until he's seen reports from a majority of the agents. Okay? Once he's done that, he's in a position to choose an anchored value. How does he do that? He looks back through the previous rounds. For each round, he says, is that round dead? If so, forget it. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it's not dead, then it must have a value. And, and if, if it has a value, I choose that value. If it's dead, I skip over it and work back. And I keep doing that until I either find a round that's not dead, or I get to the beginning. And if I get to the beginning, then I can choose any allowed value. And the convenient thing to do is to choose an allowed value from my own allowed set. But I don't actually have to do that. I could go and look for some other leader, take one of his allowed values. That would be OK, too. OK, so now the leader's chosen the value for round n. But we haven't got an answer yet, remember. This is just the leader's whim so far. Now the leader commands the agents to accept his value. So he sends out a command message. And the agent says, if I haven't already done something about round n, then I will accept your value. Why might I have already done something? Well, it's possible that some other leader got cranked up and started around with a bigger n, and that I got a query from him. In that case, I would have set my state to no. And I can't change it once it's set, so I might not be able to accept your value. But if my state is still neutral, then I'll accept it. Then they all report again. And if the leader sees a majority that have accepted, then it can publish the outcome. OK. So now if you follow the argument up to now, you should believe that this has to work. 
because it maintains both invariants. Right? It maintains the invariant that there's only one value per round by virtue of the way the leaders number the rounds. And it maintains the anchored invariant by virtue of the way the leaders make the choice. So let's look at an example, but it may not be very intuitive. So let's look at an example. Here are a bunch of agents doing their thing. In, so there's, there's two cases that I've done. In this case, we do three rounds and we don't get the consensus. In this case, we do three rounds and we got the consensus on the second round. Okay? So in this case, what happens is some leader cranks up, um, queries everybody, nobody's got anything. The leader can choose any allowed value. He chooses three. He sends out his command guys. Now, in the meantime, a second leader has cranked up and has queried everybody and managed to talk to B and C. So B and C get the query for round two. So they set their, their state to no for round one. A doesn't get the query. He gets the command from, from round one leader first. So he sets his state to three. I've right? got a three and two no's, so he didn't make any progress. Okay? So the leader for round one is not happy. He has to start a new round. The leader for round two, same bad thing happens to him. He, find, he gets the no responses from these guys. He can choose any value he wants because this round's dead. So he chooses four. So he sends his command out. A, again, is, is, is quick and gets the four and sets his state to four. But in the meantime, someone has cranked up and started to run round three. And he sends out a query for round three. B and C get that query, so they set their state to null. So by the time they get the commands, it's too late. They've already set their state to null. Now the round three guy gets his response back. He sees that this round is dead, so he can do whatever. And this round is dead, too, so he can do whatever he wants. So he chooses five, sends that out. This time, C is quick and gets the five, but somebody else is cranked up on round four, which I didn't write down, sent out queries for round four and gotten no's in for A and B. So we've done three rounds. We've started a fourth round. We haven't made any progress. What's bad? This shows that it's not a good idea to have lots of leaders, because even though we don't make any mistakes, we don't get consensus either. It's fortunate that we don't get consensus all the time. Why? Because we have a theorem that says we can't have it. So if we had an algorithm that was guaranteed to terminate, we, know, we would know that we're in trouble. We must have made a mistake. So. OK. Over here, things worked out better. We started out with somebody trying to get consensus on four, and it worked out badly, the same as it did over here. But here in round two, what's happened is that this guy cranked up. He sent out his queries. He got these two no's back. He chose five keeping his, his choice anchored. He chose five, and this time he was lucky. A and C both got the command and set their values to five. Uh, B set his value to null because round three it cranked up. So round three gets back responses from some majority. Let's say it's these two guys. He sees a no and a five. That round's not dead. So he is stuck with five. So another way to think about this is that once a round has gotten a majority, it acts as a barrier to any subsequent leader. As the subsequent leader collects state and looks back through the state, this round is not going to be dead. So he's not going to be able to get past that round to choose some earlier value. He's going to have to choose this round's value. And that intuitively is why it is that subsequent rounds are always going to choose the same value. Okay. Now there's only one more thing to say about this algorithm, which is um, how about choosing a leader? We saw that having lots of leaders is bad because it can lead to a situation where you don't get consensus. So how are we going to choose a leader? Well, we know we're not going to have a foolproof way of choosing one leader because if we did, we'd have a foolproof way of getting termination, and we know we're not going to have that. What we'd like to do is get one leader um, most of the time. So what we need is a sloppy algorithm for choosing a leader. And it's pretty easy to find a sloppy algorithm for choosing a leader if, if it's usually the case that you have some bounds on it on how much time it takes to send, receive, and process messages. So what's the sloppy algorithm? Remember, I say usually. These bounds might not always hold. But if they hold most of the time, then we'll be in good shape. Uh, if you think you might want to be a leader, you broadcast your identity. And if you don't hear from someone else who's got a bigger name than you do, by, by the end of this round trip time that is bounded in this way, then you say, OK, I must be the best guy around. I'll become the leader. So it's clear that if things are working well and the, message, and the broadcast messages are getting through uh, within this maximum time, then there will only be one leader. Now, we can't guarantee that that's true. So sometimes this method will choose two leaders, in which case the algorithm will spin its wheels and run some rounds and not make any progress. But if things eventually settle down, then it will immediately make progress.
Okay, so that there it is. That's the Paxos algorithm. Um, it has it's about as fault tolerant as you can imagine. All it requires is that eventually you manage to talk to a majority of these guys. It doesn't have to even be the same majority for the queries and for the commands. Um, it's a little bit expensive because we were shipping, we were remembering all those old boats and shipping them all, all those old values, that, all those old states of the of the agents, and shipping them around. And that was a lot of stuff, but we don't actually have to remember all that stuff. If you look closely, you'll see that the relevant part of, I, of agent I's state is just the most recent value that he accepted, and the later no states. So if we have some round last with the property that, he, that agent I chose V in round last, and agent I chose no for all the rounds between last and some other round next, and agent I is still neutral for all rounds bigger than next, then that's all we need to know. We can code this information up as simply the value V and the values of last and next. And that's all you really need to report. So it's just three numbers. OK, the other optimization that's important is we can see this algorithm is not very cheap because we had to do a query <coughs> round trip and then a command round trip and then send the answer. So that was two and a half round trips to get the consensus distributed. Um, if we're running a state machine, we have a sequence of consensuses, not just one. And we can take advantage of that by the following trick. Um, number, run a whole sequence of instances of the Paxos consensus algorithm. One for state machine input one, a second one for state machine input two, a third one for state machine input three, and so forth. So let's number those sequences by, by P's, okay? And let's make this uh, V last next response for agent I and instance P encode the fact that um, the state is no for all Q's bigger than P and all M's less than next. So when, the, when you report that your state is, whatever your state is for the, for, for the current um, input. If future inputs that you haven't decided, you haven't even heard about yet, you vote no on automatically. So that means that you can run all the query rounds simultaneously. As long as the leader stays the same, this will be useful. So the leader has to send one of these query guys out, and then he gets, get, gets the information, he gets the query information from a majority of the agents for all of the future instances of consensus. So now all he has to do is send commands out. We only have to do the query once. After that, we only have to send commands out until the leader changes. Of course, once the leader has changed, it's going to be a different number, and then you're going to have to query again. The result of that is you only have to have a, the query round trip once per change in leaders, not once per step in the state machine. And the other step you do is if there's going to be a sequence of state machine messages, you do the standard trick of piggybacking the outcome message on the command message for the next state input. Or if a state input doesn't come along for a while, things are pretty idle, then maybe you'll send out the outcome message. But in that case, you don't care because the load is low. In the normal case where the load is high, uh, there'll be another um, command message coming along very soon. You can just piggyback the outcome on that. So now instead of five messages, two and a half round trips, we only have two messages, which is one round trip. So it's pretty reasonable. Uh, it's still not as efficient as making the decision locally, which is why the leasing scheme had, had, has charms. But it's not too bad. Okay, and that is the end of the story. I'll just uh, put up a summary here of what I told you about. And we talked about how to build a highly available system using consensus. And our basic idea is run a deterministic state machine, get consensus on each input, and then to make it more efficient, use leases to replace most of the consensus actually, consensus states. I showed you the best algorithm for doing consensus without real-time guarantees, which is access algorithm of Leslie Lamborts. And the basic idea was, instead of just trying to get a majority once, repeat rounds until you finally get a majority. And, it, and the trick is you have to make sure that every round, um, once a majority has been achieved, every later round gets the same majority. And finally, I've discussed the general strategy for designing and understanding concurrent fault tolerant algorithms, which is write down a simple spec as a state machine, find an abstraction function from your implementation, and then turn the crank that shows that the implementation simulates the spec. And the crank turning is completely mechanical. Finding the abstraction function can be hard. If you want to follow up any of this stuff, here are some references on various aspects of, this, of the things that I've talked about. And I'd be happy to entertain some modest number of questions. Yes? Thanks. Nice.
a bee and I see nearby bees dance more vigorously, then I go out and I examine the site of where the site the scouts chose. I then switch, uh, I make a decision, a local decision based on what I saw versus the place I then visited in the first round. And a whole set of the bees, scout bees, then switch to, to a set. You go to one or two rounds of, of that sort, each coming back. If you, if you reach two majorities, there's a stochastic uh, probability <laughs> that the bees will, will switch yeah. to a yeah. close site. And you will have arrived at a fault tolerant consensus. And the criteria are well known by you know, bee experts who put up a whole sense of fake potential high sites to know exactly how they're chosen. But it seems to me in this algorithm, what is your, your you, you said that being as not deterministic as possible is better. And here you're forcing all the bees, if I understood it correctly, all the, all the agents, to, to work on a, a single pro, uh, possibility at once and also to commit to a no uh, at, at re relatively early point compared to the, the bee algorithm. Uh, the bees are allowed to make oh, well, well. commitments and switch. Stop. <laughs> Some, someone else should have a chance to ask a question, too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, proposing, I'm, I'm asking you to comment on how this algorithm compares to that well known algorithm. I can't do that on the fly, but I would certainly be interested <laughs> in <laughs> seeing the details of the bee algorithm. Well, well, just, it, it would be very. It would I be just very. Basically told you critical, critical points. Long experience tells us that the only way you can actually understand these things is to write down very carefully what the steps are and analyze it very carefully. And you can't do that on the fly. At least I can. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.